Yeah. Oh, good. Okay. So you want to moderate or? Um... No, I've already moderated. Okay. So this will be oh, okay. Did you guys use the HDMI or did you use the serial? Uh, the HDMI. The okay, so I might have to workshop. Okay, so you better run. Yeah, so okay. I may need to do that just to. That's fine. Yeah, I realize I'm, I'm trying to get through my material. study, which wasn't published in Nature, was mentioned in an editorial in Nature. So, so yeah, I was wondering, was that really published in Nature? No, the, his paper was not. It's okay. pretty, I mean, it reminds me of this field that, you know, in the 1800s called phrenology, when people would sort of, you know, measure your skull and try to <laughs> infer your personality and so on. Darwin had a, 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 his head shape was quite pleasing to, to those who believed in phrenology. That was one reason why he was acceptable as a captain's sort of companion on the voyage of the Beagle. <coughs> line about if you take your results to the statistician and ask for advice once the experiment is over, the most they can do is tell you why it died. <laughs> um, and uh, so th this notice went around um, uh, by email. I just want to mention it again. The stats department does have, they train statisticians in, in their courses where students in the statistics department have to, or, or must listen to people like us who don't really know very much about um, statisticians and then they learn how to provide advice. So anyway, those are, the, those are some of the, the um, opportunities that are available if you need help. Um, and there is the uh, um, general statistical consulting in the first hour is free. Thank you. 
Okay, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the difference between random and fixed effects and how that influences um, how we should analyze data. This will um, reiterate some facts that we already talked about in the second week of the course where we read the Hurlburt paper and recognized that some data are, um, are analyzed as though the independent or the, the measurements themselves are um, independent, which is pseudo-replication if those measurements of themselves come in the form of random groups. So I want to talk about, again, what random effects uh, are. I won't talk much about pseudo-replication, but instead talk about a method uh, of linear models called linear mixed effects models, which is meant to solve that problem and allow you to analyze data without fear of pseudo-replication. And then in the workshop on Thursday, we'll get you uh, trying this um, program out. So first, uh, what are fixed effects? So anytime you have a predetermined category uh, of a variable, and that category is of direct interest. It's a treatment, say, a medical or pharmaceutical treatment. And not only that, but it's repeatable. So if a person A does a particular experiment, person B can go out and actually repeat that experiment because the, the categories are definable and, and you could apply the same <coughs> in a repeat. And so, you know, here's examples of what would be considered um, fixed effects. One feature of fixed effects is that any conclusion that you reach in this study uh, would apply only to the groups that were included in this thing. So, uh, the, uh, the result of um, a clinical trial in which two medical treatments are compared the results of that experiment are applicable to those true medical treatments and not to other medical treatments, obviously. So that's a feature of fixed effects. Here's an example of a fixed effect. Um, it's a factorial experiment. And in a factorial experiment, um, two or more factors are manipulated and all combinations of them are included. So this is a Chris Harley experiment where he looked at uh, herbivory and um, its effect on algal density in the intertidal. And so he set up these uh, rings where um, herbivores were excluded and these sort of rings where uh, herbivores were included and then looked at algal growth and repeated this at two different um, uh, intertidal zones, low and mid intertidal. And the results uh, would look something like this in a, in a box plot where the herbivore treatment is along the bottom and the measurement is along the y-axis, the amount of algae at the end of the experiment. And uh, the finding in this case was that there was an interaction between these two factors whereby herbivore treatment had a strong effect um, at, uh, uh, in low parts of the intertidal but not at mid heights in the intertidal. Okay, so both of those treatments would be considered fixed. You can analyze this in LM, which I did, in, uh, in R, and um, the key is that the results of the experiments are applicable only to the treatments that were included in this experiment, and wouldn't or couldn't be used to, to tell you what you should expect at high, higher areas in the intertidal, and so on. And the typical way in which um, we analyze such experiments is using LM, as I said, in, uh, in R, and in the, in the old days, before, um, before R, and when we uh, did a lot of our statistics uh, by hand, we would set up these ANOVA tables, and there would be formulas to calculate sums of squares and degrees of freedom, and so on. But a key feature of an ANOVA table with fixed effects is that when calculating your F statistics for testing the effects of um, fixed treatments, like herbivory, or the intertidal zone, or the interaction between them, is that the residual error is in the denominator. And for each of the tests of the treatment effects, you have, you know, in this case, 238 um, uh, degrees of, uh, sorry, uh, 60 degrees of freedom to work with, that the, um, the mean square that occurs in the denominator of F is based on the residual, and that's possible because uh, as long as the treatments are interspersed and so on, every, every little uh, square on the intertidal where the experiment was applied is its own independent observation. 
how are they different? How are random effects different? So the difference in, uh, between a random effect and a fixed effect is that a random effect is actually randomly sampled from a group of such effects. And uh, examples might include um, a random sample of families. And uh, the measurements you might make would be made on the siblings belonging to those families. Uh, subjects themselves can be considered groups as well if repeated measurements are made on those subjects. The repeated measurements themselves are the, um, you know, the equivalent of the siblings in families and the subjects are random. Or they might be randomly placed transects of, uh, uh, of quadrats in a survey. Or they might be plots in a field where treatments can be applied. Or they might be environment chambers containing aquaria where experiments on, say, fish are carried out. In, random, in, in, in models that account for random effects, the groups are assumed to be random, even if you haven't actually gone out and randomly sampled two chambers from a, uh, a universe of chambers. You're just going to use the two or four chambers that are available to you. But nevertheless, they would be modeled as random effects. Because the groups themselves, the treatments, are randomly sampled from a population, conclusions about the experiment can then be applied to the population itself, and not just to the groups that were included in the study. And so that, that is a distinction between random effects and fixed effects. Fixed effects apply only to the groups that were included in the study. Random effects are applied can be generalized to the population from which those groups were sampled. Uh, in a lot of cases, the random effects that we have in our study are a nuisance. We don't really want them there. We don't care about them so much. We don't really want to know whether plot 354 is different from plot 355. It's not repeatable. If anyone repeats your experiment, they're not going to go to the same plots. So all you want to do is somehow make sure that when you model your uh, results, plots are in there, but then somehow their effects go away, and then you can focus on the, the things you're really interested in. But there are a lot of kinds of experiments in which um, measuring the variance associated with different levels of random groups is actually of direct interest. That's especially true in genetics. And so in those studies where randomly sampled families, multiple siblings are maybe measured, you know, we might want to do thing like uh, do something with those data, like estimate, say, the heritability of some trait using this kind of a data set. Heritability is something that you estimate using the components of variance that a random effects model would estimate for you. And so on. We might want to know the repeatability of measurements uh, made up of a single individual. And in some cases, we might want to know something about the variability from place to place in our transects. The key thing that um, we're going to learn here and in the workshop is that the random effects must be included somehow in the model. <clears throat> but um, uh, they, they must be handled differently. And that's because the siblings are not uh, uh, independent if they belong to the same family. So somehow that group structure has to be incorporated. And doing so properly will avoid the sin of pseudo replication. So, um, you know, the factorial experiment that I just described contrasts that with uh, another experiment that was carried out by um, Fatuma and Philippi. And it was a study of the fall canker worm and the effects of different tree species on their growth. So, caterpillars of this species feed on a bunch of um, hardwood trees. And uh, something I didn't know until I looked up this study was that uh, many fall canker worms reproduce clonally, producing daughters that are genetically identical to themselves. As part of the study then, um, Fatuma and Philippi sampled uh, females, uh, asexual essentially females from the population, and had them each produce uh, a, a large number of daughters. And then the research questions were um, involved things like, what are the effects of tree species on growth, but also how much do clones vary in growth? And the second question in particular is not a question about specific clones, but about the population of fall canker worms. 
and the idea would be to generalize to that population on the basis of a random sample of the clones actually used in the experiment. Uh, so here are the results of their um, experiment. The design involved uh, nine female moths were collected from the population and then they were uh, um, bred in the lab to produce a large number of larvae, um, uh, hundreds of them, and then in each clone multiple larvae were uh, raised on each um, tree type. So the distinction now from the uh, the Harley experiment is that uh, we do have one fixed factor, tree species, that's the repeatable thing. I could go out and repeat this study um, on the same species of tree, but I can't go out and repeat this study on the same clones that Timmy used because they were just randomly sampled from the population and they're long gone. This is a graph. Uh, th this style of graph is called uh, an interaction plot. and. Uh, in the graphics lecture, um, I talked about how you, uh, or strategies for um, graphing data that are paired or grouped. So an interaction plot is one way to do this. So each of these lines connects the dots for um, a single uh, clone. And thus, rather than just have a scatter of points, the, 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 the fact is clear that the same clone was measured repeatedly on all four tree types. So it's a kind of repeated measures. Oh yeah, the other thing is, I'm not showing you all the, the larvae, hundreds of larvae on this plot. And as, uh, as I, uh, I said in the graphics lecture, show the data, if uh, at all possible. Rule number one in, in uh, graphing uh, is to show the data. But um, my answer to that is, well, it would be too messy to include it all here. But the other thing is also to um, to start you thinking about what happens when there are random effects, and that is when thinking about the effect of tree species, the larva isn't actually the independent observation, it is the clone. And so to that extent, this graph does show the data. It shows you the means for clones. So, uh, yeah, just to repeat, clones might be randomly sampled, and they'll vary from one another. And as a result, caterpillars from the same clone are not independent. So it would be pseudo-replication to just throw all these caterpillars into the, uh, a single analysis and pretend that they are independent. And um, I wrote this note here, and that is, um, when you report your results in your thesis and in manuscript, and uh, I always ask this of writers when I'm reviewing papers as well, and that is when they tell me their F statistics, they should always tell me their de degrees of freedom, because I can then identify right away whether they've used the clone or the caterpillar as their independent replica. So it's always a good idea to put in your de degrees of freedom to prove by your degrees of freedom that you've done the analysis properly. So the analysis is different when there are random effects, and one reason I already gave is that the Caterpillar is not the, the larva is not the independent observation that the clone is. But one reason why it has to be dealt with differently is that in, the, in a fixed effect, there's only one source of randomness, and that is sampling error among the individual, in, in, say in the Harley experiment, among the individual plot. But random effects adds another layer of random variation variation among clones, as well as variation among caterpillars within clones, in this particular example. So within a clone, I can model, for this particular clone, I can model the mean growth rate on each of the tree species. And uh, that would be modeled as having a, a component of mean for that clone, and then uh, error, which would be based in this case on the individual caterpillars within that clone. But that's just one layer, because uh, the other layer is that when looking at the mean effect of tree species in the population as a whole, you know, the mean, the mean, the mean and the mean, um, the, the model will treat the clone and not the caterpillar as the independent observation. And the uh, appropriate error uh, associated with the estimates of means will come from the variability among the clones, not the variability among the caterpillars. So random factors add another layer of randomness, and it has to be modeled explicitly. <coughs> 
There's some other reasons why analysis is different when random effects are. <coughs> so in the in the Harley experiment, um, the groups were all fixed, and the treatment means are of direct interest. You know, we want to know how much herbivory there is in the presence and absence of herbivores. Those numbers, those magnitudes, uh, are are important. They help us determine the biological significance of the of the results. Um, but in the in the case of random effects, um, you know, the the clone values will be estimated by the model, but in general they're not of direct interest. What's of interest in a random effects model is not the means of the clones that you randomly sample, because they're gone. They're not repeatable. I'd never be able to duplicate that. But what is uh, repeatable is the estimate of the variation among the different random groups, because that applies to the population. And so more typically in models with random effects, you, you hear about things called variance components. And uh, as I mentioned, that was one of the goals of the Fatima and Philippi experiment, was to actually estimate those variances. It's not just all about means, but also about the variability and its magnitude. Something more technical is that when uh, an experiment has both random effects and fixed effects, um, when I was a student and we had to calculate data using, or analyze data with uh, computers, or with ANOVA tables in books like Sokol and Rolf, who had all the formulas there, those equations and those methods uh, always assumed that the experiment was balanced, that no plants died in the execution of your experiment to cause the numbers of individuals to be unbalanced between groups and uh, between treatments. And uh, it turns out no one ever came up with a sort of a, 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 a a simple formula that would allow you to account for um, an unbalanced design when there are random effects in the model. And so, even as brief a time as when, between now and when I was a graduate student, uh, the ability to actually analyze experiments that have unbalanced designs has, has really uh, um, improved. Standard ANOVA calculations don't actually work. Your F statistics don't have an F distribution when you're um, experiment has unbalanced design. And that, that's uh, neither here nor there now because we have methods to deal with that. But in those days, I remember, uh, you know, consoling a, a graduate student who was trying to analyze the results of a, a complicated experiment, and she had gone to the st statistics department and asked them how is she going to analyze this because her design is so un un unbalanced. And the answer was to randomly throw away data points in order to balance the design of the experiment so that she could actually test whether her effects were significant. That's crazy. I don't have to do that anymore. Um, but one caution, it is still the case that when analyzing unbalanced designs, the F statistics that computer packages will give you our, our best approximation. So, so they're never going to be uh, exact. And uh, some, um, some packages like LMER for, for modeling random effects have the uh, sort of take the strong position that um, we know what's good for you. And, uh, and as a result, they won't even give you a p-value. They'll calculate an f-statistic, and then you just take that home and deal with it. <laughs> but, but somebody else has created a package called LMER test that will take the results of LMER and some strong characters involved in the creation of R and some of its parent uh, packages. But just remember, unbalanced designs are still somewhat of an issue when there are random effects. How do you know when you have random effects in your study when you maybe didn't plan it? Well, whenever your sampling design is nested, quadrats within transects, transects within woodlots, woodlots within districts. So when there's some sort of um, structure, hierarchical structure to the sampling itself, you may not have wanted to do it that way, that was convenient, but now that it's done, analysis must follow the design. And, uh, uh, you know, quadrats are randomly sampled, and transects perhaps randomly sampled, and so those become random effects that you have to take into account now when you're modeling the results of your experiment. Also, you know, in ecology, when you do your experiments outdoors, 
particularly, and actually, you know, different sides of benches or different chambers, there's usually some kind of a spatial structure that affects the measurements you're interested in anyway. And uh, those are sort of random with respect to the um, um, treatments that you're interested in. And if your replicates come in groups placed spatially, then those spatial units become blocks, which are then also modeled as random effects in, uh, in uh, linear models. And you divide up plots, and then you you know split them and apply different treatments to to uh, each side of the plot, or you know, siblings and families, or anything like that. Different kinds of split plot type uh, structures are uh, always evolve um, random effects. Paired paired uh, design is an example of a, um, a, a design that has random effects. Whenever you take measurements on related individuals, and whenever you measure subjects repeatedly. So those are many circumstances in which random effects uh, are present, and then you have to um, incorporate them. So most uh, statistical packages assume, when you ask it to fit a linear model, that you know what you're doing, and that all of the factors that you're telling it about, such as clones, it will assume automatically that they're all fixed. And so uh, usually you have to figure out how to tell the computer package that, no, 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 this variable clone is actually a random effect. So some searching might be involved if you're not using R, but using other um, package. And uh, indeed, the package that we used last week in um, the workshop, LM, it assumes that all effects are fixed. So you can't use LM if your model includes random effects. And uh, there are probably the two most widely used packages in R are the NLME package and the LME4 package, and the two functions that, that you would use are LME or LMER, and we're mostly going to use this one in the, in the workshop. <coughs> and uh, both of these packages have the advantage that they explicitly model the variance structure, the hierarchical structure groups. Um, and uh, the, the, these, um, the ME stands for mixed effects in LME linear mixed effects models. And uh, the attributes of linear mixed effects models is the, is the most recent jargon for these kinds of models is because they usually eat models with random effects uh, uh, include both fixed and random effects. And um, having fixed and random effects means that there are sort of different layers associated with the random and the fixed components, and when you specify the model, you actually specify a random part and a fixed part. And I'll show you how, and there's a different um, error variance for each source of randomness. The method used for estimating and testing is based on restricted maximum likelihood, and uh, that's the reason that unequal sample sizes can be handled when they could not before, and you need computers to do this. As I mentioned, uh, when designs are unbalanced, the uh, uh, F statistics are still approximations, and what that does is it makes the p-values that you get conservative, which is better than the, the reverse. Okay, so I'm going to show you an example of a very simple um, mixed effects model. And it is a, uh, a study of uh, repeated measurements of individuals of this bug. So uh, Bernie Crespi and Patrick Nussel did a number of studies on these walking stick insects. And uh, in one of the studies, what they did is they looked at the extent to which the traits they were interested in measuring were actually repeatable when measured again. And so they were interested in measuring uh, or calculating a term called repeatedly, re repeatability. What fraction of measurements are uh, like within individual? To what extent do you get the same measurement twice when you measure the same individual twice? And uh, so, um, <coughs> here's how they carried out the study. They um, took uh, specimens, which they had in envelopes, of this uh, walking stick, placed it on a surface, and then with a digital camera took a photograph of it. <coughs> and then they put the insect back in the envelope, and then they put the envelope back on the shelf. And they measured everybody. And then what they did was they went back to the envelope, removed the envelope, placed the insect on the um, 
on the surface and then took another photograph. And if you want to measure the repeatability of measurements, that's way better than taking the same picture twice in a row after you. Because presumably you would get a very high repeatability in that case. So they really wanted to go through the whole process of you know, mounting it, placing it, the angle of the camera, and everything else. And uh, the data they're going to show you are based on one measurement, which was then taken from the, um, uh, the digital photographs, the length of the femur. So um, I've got a plot here which just arrays the individual walking sticks from left to right in this sample of, I think, 25 individuals. And then along the y-axis, I've plotted the two measurements that they obtained in their um, analysis. And uh, surprise, surprise, they didn't get exactly the same measurement each time. In fact, they never got the same measurement twice. So, there, so you know, measurement error is real even from digital photographs. You know, in some cases, there was a, a reasonable difference between them. Must have grown. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that would be that would be a valid hypothesis, one to be considered and tested experimentally. If I uh, also added this something I did not mention, which is that they were all dead. <laughs> so shrink, maybe, but it would be possible. So what they did is they modeled the, the um, measurements that they obtained. And the structure of the sampling uh, is hierarchical, and so I've drawn it here just to sort of reinforce that impression. Here are all the walking stick insects individuals, and then here are the two measurements made on each of those individuals. So they have a data set which is twice the number of the measurements as individuals, because each individual was measured twice. And the, the um, a linear model is, can, can be used to describe the variation in the measurement. And this linear model would have really two parts. And uh, the, the first part is the, um, well, let me first describe what the terms are. So we model the measurement, an individual measurement, as a function of the mean measurement for the uh, for femur in the population, plus a random deviation which represents the difference between the measurement of uh, each individual eye and the mean for the population, and then a random error which represents the variation among measurements taken within the individual bugs. And there are really then two parts in modeling the variation in all of the measurements. And the first part we can think of as the random part, and that's the measurement of each individual bug, which gives us a, 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 a bi, and then a, a, a source of randomness, which is the variation among repeat measurements made on that individual. And then the other part, which is the fixed part, where we estimate the, the fixed mean of the entire population. That is modeled as the mean of the bug means. And so the source of error for this component, measuring the constant that is, or estimating the constant that is the mean of all the walking sticks in the population, the random error component is the variability among the bug, the bug means. Okay? So there again, there's two um, sources of random error, the, in this case the measurement error, the variation within individuals, and then the variation between individuals, and each of them is used differently in modeling the two the random and the fixed part of the, of the linear model. And so to analyze the data, I used the NLME package. And uh, LME then, in, in, in um, uh, fitting the data, we specify two formulas rather than one. And uh, one of the formulas is the fixed. And that models femur length as a constant. And that's basically saying to R, we want to estimate the the, um, the mean of all of the femurs in the population. And uh, in this case, it's just um, the simplest possible uh, fixed effect linear model. You're just estimating the mean for the population based on the measurements. And then the second formula uh, instructs R as to what the random component of uh, the model is. And here again, we wanna, we're, we're asking R to estimate a um, 
a constant, but in this case, one for every individual, which constitute the random groups. So that's the structure of the random part and how we tell uh, R that the individual is the random group here. And we're modeling a random intercept, namely every individual has its own intercept. And it's the variability among those intercepts that will then be used in the fixed part. Okay, so this is so last week, and this is um, sort of the new component that will be added on. And um, it might be a good idea before the workshop on Thursday to maybe review last week's workshop just to sort of have it straight in your mind how LM works so that you can appreciate the, the, the different way in which random effects are modeled as a sort of extension of that rather than something you know, totally new. Yeah, the random fermion starts out at a constant to the two measurements within each individual, <clears throat> and it, it produces a fitted value for each individual. <clears throat> and it mostly does that so that, uh, you know, it calculates the variance among individuals. And it's the variance components that are of greatest interest. And then there's the fixed part, which estimates the mean fever length in the population itself. So I gave the impression that, you know, there are two parts, there are two stages, R fits one, fits the other, but actually it analyzes it all together. And as is typical, when we um, fit a model, we store the results in some object, linear mixed effects model object in this case here, and then we use functions to extract useful bits from that object. And what I've done here is I've extracted the fitted values. And uh, using the fitted values in, uh, uh, on the model object for um, a linear mixed effects model yields something called the blups, which I just had to tell you about because it's, <clears throat> well, it's a music, I guess. <laughs> and, and, and it stands for the best linear unbiased predictors. And they're kind of cool. They're, they're not exactly the means for each insect. They, they have the property that they're shrunk. <clears throat> And uh, so what I've done is I've got the same graph here as last time. I've obliterated the, two, the lines connecting the pairs of dots of repeat measurements made on the single individual. And with a little red dot, I have shown you what the fitted value uh, looks like for the, um, for the random groups. And um, what, what you observe is that um, the the fitted values are not just the means of the two measurements. And the reason for that is that if you estimated the variation among the walking sticks using the means of each of the groups, um, you would get two things. You would get both the true, you would be estimating both the true variation among the bugs in their measurements, but you would also be uh, including a component of uh, measurement error itself in that variation, right? Because you've only measured two measurements. There's still a component of measurement error in the variation among the, uh, the individuals. And the general tendency, and this is the tendency that produces the regression effect that we learned about in the reading, the more, the more extreme the measurements, the more likely it is that they are overestimated. The most, you know, the more large, the, the largest extreme measurements will tend to be overestimated, and if you measure them a third time, they would regress to the mean. And the smallest measurements, because they are at the extreme, they would be the ones most likely, if measured a third time, to move toward the mean again. So this sort of tendency of regression toward the mean is actually explicitly incorporated in generating the um, the fitted values for the for the individual bugs, and it's the variation among these fitted values that allows you to estimate the variance among the individuals without including a measurement error component. So they remove the bias caused by measurement error. So that's why you know the largest extreme, this red dot, is displaced downward. The measurements that are at the smallest extreme, the measurement is displaced upward, and those in the middle are hardly displaced at all. So now that you've read this paper on the regression effect, you have some understanding of that concept. So Veracore is another function that extracts interesting and useful values from the fitted model object. And uh, 
and in particular it extracts the variance components for the, for the random sources of variation. And in a model with random effects, there's always at least two. In, in the simplest example, there are two sources of random variation. And one of them is the variation among the repeat measurements within each individual. And the other is the variation among the uh, individual insects. And repeatability is calculated from those quantities. So if you go bare core Z, it'll give you a table that looks like this. Intercept residual. And you'll go, what? This is measuring the variability among the random intercepts that we stated in the, uh, the random part of the model formula, or its square root, standard deviation. And the, the residual is always the um, variation among the repeat measurements within the random group. So those are the estimates of the variance attributable to those two sources of random variation. And the uh, the estimate of the among. So repeatability is just the among as a fraction of the total. And so we can estimate repeatability as this quantity over the sum of the two sources of variation. And uh, we get the estimate of 75%. 75% of the... Um, so the repeatability is 0.75 or 75%. 75% of the variability among measurements of walking sticks is true variation among individuals. 25% is a measurement error. So that's, that's pretty useful. 25% seems like a fairly large number. It didn't look so bad when I produced the plot, but when you're measuring something small, um, it can be substantial. So there are several other designs that um, include random effects, and that would then um, cause you to use a linear mixed effect modeling approach to fit those um, data. And um, I think we, we might analyze these data in the workshop this Thursday. I'm not going to go through the analysis again, but just give you, again, some more general um, thoughts on random effects and how they work, and uh, how you design experiments well when there are random effects. Um, so. Uh, the design here is uh, a repeated measures design in which individual fish, goldfish, are um, uh, tested for their sensitivity to different wavelengths of light. How well can a goldfish see red, orange, uh, you know, green, and blue? It turns out their maximum sensitivity is gold, <coughs> is, uh, is uh, in the orange wavelength. So this. Study. I think they may have had more wavelengths as well, but I'm just extracting this one. So it's a repeated measures design in that the same individual is measured over and over again. And this is bad in general. We know this because repeated measurements made on the same individuals are not independent. <clears throat> but LME and other mixed effects modeling and packages take that into account and allow you to fit data like this, provided you're very explicit about um, telling the package which effects are uh, um, fixed and which components are random. In this case, the fish are randomly sampled, or from a pet store, perhaps, and, and uh, they form the random groups. And they are groups because, as I said, they've been measured repeatedly. Just like the individual walking sticks are become groups when they are measured repeatedly. So fish are randomly sampled, but um, measurements within fish are, are not independent. And then the fixed treatment effect is uh, wavelength. And uh, in this case, there are, are four treatments. So one of the reasons why I wanted to show this is that um, in doing experiments like this and obtaining repeat measurements on individuals, you still have to be sure that um, you know, certain conditions aren't met, that there isn't, say, some kind of a carryover effect. You know, you measure the fish once, you measure it again, you might pretty much get the same measurement if you don't wait long enough. There's potentially a carryover effect like that. And um, the optomotor response doesn't apparently show any kind of a carryover effect. So you can measure it a uh, hundred times um, and uh, still get exactly the same response. They don't habituate to um, uh, this particular kind of treatment for or another. Um, and also the other feature of the experiment is that the 
categories of the fixed effect weren't delivered in the same order to every individual. The order was randomized for each individual. And uh, the reason that becomes useful, I'll, I'll mention later, because if you do give them in the same order, then um, you open up the association between your treatments and time. And uh, time becomes difficult to model, for reasons I'll explain later. So that's one kind of an experiment. We did an experiment uh, which uh, follows a, a traditional, what's called a split plot design, where we had two treatments of interest, and then a random, a random factor. So whole ponds were assigned uh, either one or the other of two predation treatments. That's the fixed effect. Each pond was split. That's the split plot part. And a different competition experiment was uh, applied to each side. And then the ponds themselves are the random effect. And repeat measurements from the same pond, namely the results on this side and the results on that side, are... Um, <coughs> are taken into account if we explicitly include pond as a random effect in this model. So split plot designs are analyzed using uh, linear mixed effects models as well. A couple of comments about um, assumptions of linear mixed effects models. They're pretty much the same as the assumptions of linear models and uh, ANOVAs, uh, for example, in regression so you're already familiar with, but I want to reiterate and then talk uh, about one potential additional assumption that can be violated when there are um, random effects, repeated measures random effects. So first, um, we assume that the repeat measurements within groups follows a normal distribution. That's just a normal distribution assumption. Um, we also assume that the groups themselves are randomly sampled from a population of treatment groups. Um, so they are independently sampled, and they're sampled without bias. And often, uh, we don't have control over this. The, the groups might be the, your environment chambers. The groups might be the plots that you have available in the field, and you haven't sampled them necessarily from some sort of universe of plots. Nevertheless, um, there's a lot of discussion in this in the ecological literature, but basically the conclusion is they're always modeled as random effects, because they're not repeatable. The um, solutions to the model fitting actually assume that the group effects, the, the intercepts of the, um, of the uh, random groups that you fit, uh, actually follow a normal distribution. That's an assumption that's rarely tested, but it's always made. And that's an extra one that applies to um, random effects that you don't encounter in uh, models with only fixed effects. Of course, replicates within groups are also randomly sampled. And then uh, no carryover. Again, if you're repeatedly measuring the same individual, you want to perhaps wait long enough between you know, intervals of measuring that what you took as the measurement the first time won't influence the measurement you obtain the second time. And finally, there's an assumption called sphericity. And um, the sphericity means that the Variance of the difference between pairs of factor levels uh, are equal for all pairs. And I'll give you an example of where this could be violated. And it's this example, and uh, it occurs when uh, different treatments, in this case time, are presented in a fixed order that's in fact correlated with time. So this is a classic experiment from uh, um, you know, from a, a large series of experiments that were spearheaded by uh, Jim Brown years ago in the uh, deserts of the American Southwest. And uh, this was um, Diane Davidson's PhD work, and she they had these enclosures on patches of deserts, and they made them selectively um, filter uh, rodents. So certain body-sized rodents could move between them, but uh, large, uh, small mammals could not. And she was interested in whether um, this affected the density of ants, which also ate seeds. So, uh, classic experiment, the main treatment of interest was uh, rodent, whether uh, they were present or absent, or whether the small ones were present or absent. And then the other treatment was date, because uh, she took measurements of exactly the same enclosures uh, repeatedly. So this becomes like a repeated measure of uh, 
the random effect, which is in, the, in this case the plot. Uh, so in this particular experiment, there's only four plots, but they're measured repeatedly. How do you analyze this? Well, you might think that uh, you could just throw everything into your linear mixed effects um, model and you'll be fine. Um, however, there's a potential problem with experiments like this, which uh, uh, might be called, the jargon might be called subject by trials, repeated measures design. The, one of the treatments of interest, date, is presented in the same sequence for um, every individual. There's no opportunity to randomize the order of dates presented to individuals. And the reason, um, oh yeah, so here's how you would model it if you, if you did this. So again, there would be a, a random component, there would be a, an intercept, a random intercept associated, a, a mean density of ants basically for, for each plot, and those are the random groups. And then there would be two um, fixed effects that affect the end density, the number of colonies, the treatment itself, and then date. So date would be modeled as a fixed effect, plot as the random effect. But uh, there is a potential problem, and that is modeling consecutive treatments applied to all individuals. Um, even if you wait long enough that there isn't a carryover effect, there may nevertheless be a correlation between subsequent measurements made on the same um, uh, made on the same plot, with the result that two measurements made uh, consecutively might vary less from plot to plot than two measurements made uh, at a much greater distance apart. And so if the variance of the difference between treatment levels, in this case date, changes with uh, you know, the amount of time that's elapsed between those dates, then the sphericity is something so just a, a warning about treatments or, and experiments in which time is, or date is one of the factors. There's a high chance that the sphericity assumption would be violated. And that's a, something that, that's a, 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 a problem when you have repeated measures of random groups in time. There are various ways to solve that kind of a, a problem. And one is to test for sphericity and another is to um, correct for sphericity. So there are, there are methods, some discussion about how well they work, but basically the problem is that without taking sphericity violations into account, your type 1 and type 2 errors are potentially way off. And the, uh, the car package, companion to applied regression packaging, are, has these methods built in. And I learned about this from reading Quinn and Keogh, which in my mind is a very clear explanation for what sphericity is and uh, why it might be uh, potentially an issue in uh, uh, repeated measures designs that uh, involve consecutive measures in the same order for all individuals. It doesn't talk about R at all, it's just basic uh, um, stats books. There are also a number of online books available for uh, on linear effects our mixed effects models, and I've got links to a couple of them on the website for the course. So one is Pinheiro and Bates, which is sort of the classic. And they, in their first chapter, have a really good, clear explanation for what random effects are, how you should model them, and, um, and, then, and then after that, just the, bo the book it just gets harder and harder and incomprehensible. But the first chapter is, is, is really clear, and I learned a lot. I learned a lot about split plot designs as well. <clears throat> and uh, th this one's more ecologically oriented, but I found it less comprehensible than, uh, as an introductory book than at least the first, uh, it, the introductory chapters of the Pinheiro and Bates. But nevertheless, that's the other sort of standard in the field. <clears throat> One of the discussion topics that came up towards the end was the complexity of analyses and, you know, maybe we can do things simpler. That is the topic of next week's um, discussion. And, uh, yeah, Murtaugh is kind of an old salt and he thinks that maybe, ah, for most situations, we don't even need mixed models. You be the judge. Um, so I have one presenter and one moderator, but I need two more. Come on up. Step on up if you're interested. Put your name on my list and uh, uh, you can 
present or moderate next week. Thanks, everyone. See you on Thursday.